right? We all need prayers, amen? Okay, let's go to our main message. It is Matthew 25. Uh, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. When we look at scripture, there are many angles that you can uh, receive from. There can be a, a main message and there could be different degrees. And just because it has happened in the past, doesn't mean it's not for you. It is for us. Something that has happened in the past is still for us because there is nothing new under the sun. Right? That's what the Bible says. The Bible also says uh, uh, what occurs has occurred. So it's just different faces. It's a different theater setting but the core message, the core problems of life, our choices, our decision, there's nothing different really. All right? And so we have to learn to uh, take history, because even the world will look at history and try to learn. And so spiritually, we have to look at God's choices our choices, what man had made choices before, and that we do not make the same mistake over and again. Hosea says this in chapter 6. God says, I want you to show love. I want you to know my ways. I don't need your sacrifices. I don't need your burnt offering. I want you to show love. I want you to know my ways. Right? Hosea 6, 4. Most people know this. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So we think, okay, just because I don't know the Bible enough, that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, if you look at different translations, it might give more of an impact. My people are destroyed because they do not obey. That's one translation. Another translation. My people are destroyed because they do not know my ways. If you don't know God's ways, you can end up fighting against the Holy Spirit. And in Isaiah, there's a warning because at that time, God's people became the Holy Spirit's enemy. Because they continued to grieve the Holy Spirit, they became God's enemy. God's own people became God's enemy because they continue to grieve the Holy Spirit. We cannot take our salvation for granted and just say, oh, I'm saved and I can do whatever I want and God will forgive me for uh, anything I do and even in my ignorance, He'll forgive me. No, that's not fear of God. That's, take, that's trampling on grace. And we have to know that if I continue to greet the Holy Spirit, I can become God's enemy. And we don't want to become God's enemy. Amen? Amen. So here in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is likened to ten virgins or ten bridesmaids, depending on the uh, translation, who took their lamps to meet the bridegroom. Now, in this uh, translation or this context, most of the church translates this or interprets this as uh, the rapture, right? And the ten represents the church, and half the church is ready in some sense, and half are not. This is how it is interpreted to us. The lamp, right? The lamp is the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so, the five foolish virgins also have the lamp. They have the word of God. If you look at the uh, fundamental churches out there, uh, where, the, where I come from, you know, Bapt I was a Baptist, right? They have the lamp. In fact, they may have a better lamp than most other churches because they can recite a verse on top of their head. Boom, 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 boom. You know, it's just memory. Do, 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 do. But do they have oil? You see? Last night, uh, Brother Jeremiah came up and uh, gave us a word. And he testified that 
he asked God, I want to, how do I retain memory, God, of your word? I, I need to remember, because all of us need help in memorizing, right? And then he said, okay, I found an app to help me how to memorize. But then God gave him a dream and said, no, big no. And then uh, God led him to a scripture that, uh, that said, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance, right? Why? Did God say no to the app or the uh, uh, little process that may help him memorize scripture? Why did God say no? See, what well, I asked God that, and what came to me is this. See, if I, if I learn something on my own, and now I'm boom, boom, boom on my own, that could become very prideful, right? I'm then I, I can also not need the Holy Spirit as much because it's all registered in my mind and, and we can become very prideful. Many pastors are very prideful that way. They can recite scripture like boom, boom, boom. You know? If I depend on God or the Holy Spirit, right? At the given moment when I need something and He puts that in my mind, then He gets the glory. Amen. Right? It's Him who's doing the work now. It's not me. And a lot of times, you know, I don't prepare for preaching. I just kind of get the verses, and then I'm up here, and, and I, just, I just depend on God, and I trust God knowing He's going to come through for me, right? Or through, because it's His message. That's how I look at this. It's your church, God. It's your message, and you got to come through, right? Because uh, I'm just up here in position. That's it. I just got to open my mouth, and the words start coming out. Amen? Amen. Two. Five of them were foolish. Okay, so the definition here, foolish is thoughtless, without foresight. Five were wise, sensible, intelligent, and prudent. And so, you know, like I said, most of us think we're all wise ones, right? Okay, so I want you to stay neutral. Amen. Right, maybe because you might think out of pride, I, I, I'm very wise. Okay, so you just stay neutral. Three, for when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. Four, but the wise took flask of oil along with them also with their lamps. So we have two groups. They have the word of God and they have some oil. Oil represents Holy Spirit. Okay. Oil represents revelation. Uh, you know, many other churches, they can, like I said, they can recite the word. But do they have revelation? Right. Because you can know the word. You can have a lot of knowledge. But the question is, you have a Holy Spirit there to give you the interpretation, to give you the revelation, to give you the power. Because the Bible says that we need to preach with power. And we can all preach in some degree. But if the Holy Spirit is not there, we cannot preach with power. That means there's no anointing, no effect on the person receiving it. It's just words. Right? It's just... Memory is just studying now. It's not, it's not going to change your life. If the Holy Spirit is there, it's going to change your life, right? Especially if you're going to receive it and apply it. So like last week, we said, okay, church, I want you to start praying. Pray for eyes to see, ears to hear, because these are gifts from the Holy Spirit, right? It says in the book of Psalms, eyes to see, ears to hear are gifts, right? So we need God's gifts so we can see and hear the deeper secrets of God and not just the surface of the word, which is the story of the word, right? Just the story. So we know the story, but what does it mean? What does it mean in my life? How can I apply? These are the deeper revelations. Five. While the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and fell asleep. In a larger context, the church is taught as a, as a rapture event on this, right? So the church is waiting for the bridegroom, which is Jesus Christ. And that part is fine. However, if we look at it at different angles or different degrees, we have the church waiting for God personally in respect to prayers, in respect to breakthroughs, in respect to um, um, 
events, right? Finances, uh, family issues, uh, medical issues, whatever issues we have, we're waiting for God in these areas, right? Children issue, spouse issue. We're waiting for God to come and fix or answer in these issues. And so, we can be the five wise or the five foolish ones as we're still waiting for these uh, secondary issues, if you will, because I'll say the primary issue is the Lord's real return, right? When He comes for the church. And now the secondary issues is when He comes to us personally to answer or to give us breakthrough or to bring solution, restoration, etc. Amen? Amen? Now, the Lord's nature is to come at the end. Is to be late. That's how we see it though. But he's not really late. Because he's coming to you from a context of eternity. Right? So he's coming to you as far as God is concerned. Hey, it's, it's not long. I mean, one year, two year, five year for God. That's like, a, you know, maybe a little speck of dust. But because we live in the natural realm, we think one year, five years, like, <gasps> right? You can't even handle two minutes with the microwave, right? You know, the, the world is programming you, and I want you to see this. You know, we go to a restaurant. Before you can order, you sit, talk, wait 30 minutes for the food to come out. You're got oh, it's a great meal. Now you're like, five minutes, where's the food? Right? That's, that... The world is training us to be impatient. You know, and we don't even like to go to a restaurant anymore that takes time and cooks our food. And, and now the industry, they've made food where you just put it in the microwave or it's already made and they just do a little thing and boom, five minutes is out. And I said, mmm, tastes really good. Mm, yeah, fake food, huh? So I want you to see yourself, how you react when you're ordering food because you can examine your level of patience, right? We become such a busy society. We can't even spend a little time with each other. We're just busy, busy, busy. See, Egypt has increased your task. You want to find God. You want to spend more time with God. And what does Egypt do? What does Egypt do? What does the devil do? He makes you more busy. Increases the task. Throws a, no straws for you. Now you got to work harder. Right? And you finding the time with God, you have to fight for it now. You have to like search for it. Because we're just so busy. I want you to be wise. What the world is trying to do to you what the enemy is trying to do to you. What is really important in your day, right? Do you really have to take care of this or that? Or can you just let it go? Will it affect your life that much, right? Because that's the, that's the pattern. You try to get close to God, Egypt is going to increase that task on you. Amen? So the bridegroom coming can represent an event, a prayer request that you've been waiting, 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 praying, 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 praying. And you got your oil, you got your lamp. So here, now in verse 5, they begin nodding their heads and falling asleep. So the Holy Spirit told us when the five foolish ones, when they fall asleep, right, they because they don't have the extra oil and what the oil, extra oil represents. Because when we first become a Christian, you get saved and now you're doing what a Christian does. You start reading, you start praying, you start worshiping, you start going to church, you start fellowshipping, right? You start trying to learn obedience, you try to uh, submit, try to forgive, Try to let the hurt go. Try to die to yourself. So everybody starts like this, hopefully, right? At least. And so we all got some oil now. See, we all start out well. 
But then there's Christians, the five foolish, because they're waiting so long, and they don't see the result. They don't see the Lord coming to them right now. They start falling asleep, which means they now stop praying. They stop reading. They stop worshiping that, that fire, the first love, right? When they first met the Lord or when the crisis was in their life or in a desperate situation, when they're like driving to God, now it's just fading away. They're doing less with God. Less with God. So you look at your lives, you know, you look at what you do Sunday through third, Saturday. You get a word, we get all on fire, right? Get all excited. Someone pumped us up. And then because we're not seeing result, slowly backwards again. That's five foolish virgins. The five wise ones who's got the extra oil are sustaining their pace. Sustaining their relationship with God. Which means no matter, even though they fell asleep, Holy Spirit is telling us, when they fall asleep, their expectation of time of when God is coming for them or when God is going to answer their prayers, they let that go. You see? But their presence, uh, uh, their, their sustaining in God's presence to continue praying, to continue reading, continue worshiping, continuing letting God examine their hearts, continuing to submit, follow God's authority, right? Continuing to let God examine their heart to see, okay, I still haven't forgiven this person. I still got to let this hurt go, right? They're still always working spiritually, purifying, and cleansing, obeying. This is being ready on God. It comes for you, whether personally or in the final rapture. That you are always spiritually working, preparing yourself to meet the king. And the, and the five foolish ones are like, forget it, go on, it's just taking too long. I'm not, I don't care about whether I need to forgive somebody. I did. They don't go deeper. Uh, the word of hurt, oh, it doesn't hurt no more. But the spiritual wound is still there, right? There, right? It doesn't, hurt, it doesn't hurt no more physically, physically, so I just, I'm not going to address, address it anymore. How I used, How to, I used to consistently pray, pray well, you know, I, I just pray now on church, church day. day. In fact, in fact um, um, reading, reading too, uh, I read the Bible, read the Bible already, so what's the use of reading, reading, reading it again? That's a that's foolish, a foolish version. That's a foolish, foolish prize, man. And when the Lord shows up, so let's go, let's go. Then... Six, six, and nine, 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 shout, shout. Behold, behold, behold the bridegroom, come, come. Behold, behold the bridegroom, go out, go out to meet him. The person, the person shout, shout, shout. Holy the Holy Spirit. And this and shout, shout, shout can represent, represent God and God and prayer, prayer with the, with the event, event of Christ, Christ in your life, your life. Now the question, now the question, are you ready, ready? Are you ready to raise your, your chest, chest now? now? Because the because test, the is, test here. is here. Right? The test, the test is, here. is here. This midnight hour is here. The test is here. here. And, are and are you ready? ready? Have you have been preparing? Do you have you extra, extra oil? oil? You've, You've been, been always sustaining preparation by being in this presence. By always always looking at your heart to forgive, give, ready, cleanse, cleanse, and purify. Right? Staying in prayer. Having the word ready in your heart, in your mind. Against the enemy, enemy. That's your helmet, right? Right, right. this guy. It's not just bringing it on and on and pretty, pretty. It's there to protect the It's there to there meditate. It's there to there to know the word, word, to give yourself some encouragement when the enemy comes with a with the word of depression or or, or or a word to kill you. Right, right. The word is there to sustain your faith, and you know. That he is faithful because you've already experienced him in other levels that he has come through for you. Instead of thinking, oh, is he going to come? Is he going to come? Amen. 
And so, when these five foolish virgins, okay, let's go to seven. Eight. Then all those virgins got up and put their lamps in order. Crisis comes. They put their lamps in order. What does this mean? They're all praying now, all of a sudden. Now they're praying because the crisis is here. Guess what? You lost all that time. They lost all that time in which they could have built up extra oil. They lost all that time in which they could have been cleansed of something in their heart so they could pass this test that is now before them. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to put their spiritual life in order in this crisis. So when they, if we see the Lord Jesus coming for rapture, now we're like, oh, I gotta repent. If you've already repented, you don't need to repent, right? But if you got problems, you go, oh, I better repent now. He's coming. I say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Too late. Because God was telling us before he's coming, hurry up and forgive that person. I'm coming soon. Let that hurt go. I'm coming soon. You better obey me. I'm coming soon. You better stay in prayer. I'm coming soon. And the foolish one's like, he's so late. I'll just do it later. I'll get to it later. And what happens when we say that? We just lose so much time. And now the crisis has come. And now we're desperate. And now we're praying. Da, 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 help, help me, God. Help me, God. It's too late. You've got to go through what you now have sown. But this is what the wise, foolish ones do on verse 8. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for, your, for our lamps are going out. We don't have enough faith. We don't have enough resources. So they're going to go to the mature spiritual Christians, clinging onto them. Pray for me. Help me. And that's okay sometimes, you know, when we go to each other and say, pray for me, that's okay. But they don't have the foundation of confidence no more. And so they, out of desperation, whether it's a physical issue, money issue, now rather than praying and thinking they're getting it from God, they got to go to the other Christians, provide for me, help me with this. Now, sometimes God may do that, say, go to the other person. But you've got to discern your situation. Are you going to them because God's not there in your situation? Because you're not ready? Amen? Amen. Because if I have the oil, if I have extra oil, I've been constantly getting ready. Constantly examining my faith. Constantly examining my heart. I need to die here. I need to be more loving. I need to forgive. Amen? I need to, I need to die to this anger and die to this temper or harshness. That way when the test comes, it's, I can pass. I, I can control my anger because it's dead. I can now love that person who's unlovable because I've been working on it. And now I am ready. I'm ready to meet the Lord in that way. Amen? Amen? Nine. But the wise replied, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy for yourselves. You see, when that time comes and you had not prepared, when God told Egypt, Seven years of abundance coming. Seven years of famine coming after that. That means God is giving them seven years of grace to get ready for the years of lack. And this is what's happening to us spiritually right now. We are at years of abundance right now. And God is saying you better use this time to accumulate your spiritual weapons, your spiritual barns while there is abundance because when the days of lack come, you can be the five foolish or five wise. Because you will have developed, if you're five wise, you will have developed a relationship with God in which you know that He is faithful. 
And that if, if you don't have anything in the bank, you know God's going to come through for you. And you can be at peace. You got confident. But if you're five foolish who've been, who've been doing other worldly things rather than preparing, when that day comes, when, judge, when a day of destruction comes, when a day of fear comes for this world, you're just going to panic. You may even be afraid to die. What if terrorist comes? Do you have the confidence that God's going to protect you because you're in his will? And that if he called you to martyr them, that you have the confidence that I will glorify God and to be asked to be martyred is an honor rather than, no God, not me, not right now. You see? Ten. But while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in and, and with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins, the foolish ones, right, also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door. This is also Matthew 7, 21. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we pray and, and heal? Didn't we do miracles? Right? Matthew 7, 21, and Jesus says, I don't know you. You can have spiritual power. You can have a level of oil. You can be saved. You can have an encounter with God and you can even hear his voice. But on that final day, he can still say to us, I don't know you. And so to the five, wise, five foolish ones, when, when the crisis came, now... Rather than listening to their pastors and say, you better pray now. Well, things are okay. They decided, no, we'll just get to it later. And so when the crisis came, now they're praying, right? Now they're trying to catch up. They're trying to catch up on their reading. They're trying to catch up on their prayer. Trying to catch up on worship. Catch up on obedience. Catch up on trying to cleanse their heart. Catch up on forgiving. Catch up on trying to let the hurt go. And then they come to God. Okay, I think I'm ready, God. And the Lord's going to say, I don't know you. Why? Because they didn't sustain their relationship with God. It's like being married, right? You get married at the beginning. You have some intimacy, right? You have consummation. You get to know each other. But halfway later, you just kind of drift apart. Right? You're still living together physically. You're still in the same room. But you're, you don't know each other anymore. And when a crisis happened, are they going to abandon you? Because a lot of people, oh, oh, let's get divorced. That's what happens. 12, but he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. I am not acquainted with you. 13, watch therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. This is not just about rapture. It's about a personal encounter when the Lord comes to your life to answer a prayer, to give you a test, to either reward you or to uh, uh, take you higher spiritually. You must always be ready. And when you're always ready, the, fire, the big test, which is a rapture, now you're ready. You see? The Lord told me a long time ago, what is the definition of being rapture ready? He said to be rapture ready is, is to be overcoming your tests and trials. So when you overcome your tests and trials, it is because now you are engaging spiritually. Do you see? You are engaging spiritually of, of the problems that are in your heart, the, the relationships you have with people. You're trying to obey God's word, so you're engaging spiritually. You're staying in His presence. You're praying. You're seeking answers. You're waiting for Him. You don't get tired and go just because he has delayed. You go, okay, I stop praying. I'll do it later. 
I'm getting mad, so I'm just gonna go and uh, do the old things I used to do because it was more fun. You can still sin, go home and sin, and come back here and still pray in tongue. You can still feel God's presence here. It's not that God's letting you sin and approving it. He's just waiting for you to repent, to get right with him. But people will come and feel his presence and thinking, well, I guess God will let me slide. And so they'll go deeper into that sin. See, God doesn't necessarily just take your spiritual gifts away right away. Now, sometimes he may, but most time he won't. Because you need it. Right? You need it to come back to him. So don't measure your gifts as though, hey, you're on good terms with God. Because you could be on bad terms with God. And he could still let you have the tongue, the dance, even the ability to hear him. I told one sister somewhere else, I said, you know, just because God talks to you doesn't mean you're having a relationship with him. She's like, oh, that's right, huh? See, she's rebelling. God's talking to her, trying to get her to straighten up. But just because he's talking to her, she thinks, hey, I'm okay. So we don't want to be caught like the five foolish virgins. When the Lord comes, he's going to say, I don't know you because you stopped praying. You stopped being in my presence. You, you got disinterested in my word. You got disinterested in worship. You got disinterested in coming to church and fellowshipping with my people. You did not obey because you didn't forgive. You didn't let the hurt go. You didn't submit to my authority or listen to my servants. You forsook me. That's what God's going to say to us. You forsook me. And that's what his people constantly say in the Old Testament. What do we do wrong? God's like, you're forsaking me. See, we got to know this. That our walk with God is not a moment and it's not defined based on how you found or how he found you. It's not based on one event in your life that you had some kind of spiritual encounter, Right? It's not based on something that happened to you last year. Your relationship with God is constant. It doesn't stop. It's not supposed to slow down. It's supposed to be continuously engaging, waiting, asking God. You're depending on Him. You're trusting on Him. So every season, He's coming to you. He's answering your prayers. He's coming. He's giving you breakthrough. Right? You're realizing, wow, he's faithful. And your faith is growing. You're becoming more joyful because he's getting stronger in you. And all that hurt and unforgiveness, resentment is leaving you. Your families are being restored because now you're living by his rules, not the old rules. These are the things you need to constantly examine every moment in your life. For this is continually having the oil poured on to you. But if we get lazy, and we get, and Egypt comes and gives you a lot of work, Pharaoh comes, you know, Pharaoh's the devil, right? He represents the devil. They come. And give you a whole lot of work. A whole lot of money in your face. You know, people come to churches. I need a job. They pray, they get a job. Where are you? I'm too busy now. I got a job. They don't come to church anymore because they got a job. They're using God. How many of us are using God? We got to examine our own hearts. What is my motive? You know, John chapter 2. Jesus didn't trust any of us. Because he knows our nature. 
Our nature is to come and use Him. Our nature is to come use Him and then go. But He wants us to come, surrender, be ready to die for Him. Be ready to go all the way to Calvary, to your own spiritual Calvary. When it gets painful, you see, when God allows that spiritual nail to be pounded on your hands so that your hands now belong to Him, because that's how we pray, right? Lord, let my hand be your hands. Fine. Boom. Let my feet be your feet. Here comes the spiritual nails on your feet. Boom. You can't walk where you want. You can't go where you want. You can't do what you want with your hands. The thorns on the crown are now on your head. You can't think and do what you want. Your mind is held captive to the obedience of our Lord Jesus now. Right? Amen? He got pierced in the side, in the heart, in the lungs. Now your breath belongs to Him. Your heart belongs to Him. You see, we, we can start well, but have you finished in full surrender to Him? Because if you're not, then He may, you will face Him and He'll say, I don't know you. We started dating we kind of started getting to know each other, but we didn't come to intimacy because you left. You went to go after other idols. You did not commit to me. This is many Christians' mistakes. Throughout the Bible, same repeated mistake. That they come for some, a need, but God allows the crisis. He comes at the midnight hour to continue to help us move forward. You see, you will go through Acts chapter uh, 1631, I believe. You will go through much tribulation, test, and trials to enter the kingdom of God. This is our walk. You have to expect it. That your life, for a while, right, at the beginning, to the cross, before the resurrected new life with Christ, is going to be turmoil. It can be very painful. We will require a lot of endurance, perseverance. Require you to die on the cross with Him. So that you may come, arise into a new life. A new resurrected life in Him. This is the promised land that most Christians don't know about. They think it happened a long time ago and it's not for us. God wants us to go into the, our own spiritual promised land. This is where the greater works are. This is where your faith is on another level. This is like the millennium. So we need to pray for eyes to see, ears to hear. That we will be the five wise virgins. Not because we're smart. Because we have endured. Endured the test of time. We have endured no matter what circumstances of life or what people have told me. I'm going to stay in your presence God. I'm going to chase after you. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. No matter how much the work Egypt has to give me, I will forsake Egypt before I forsake you. You're going to be tested. We're all going to be tested. And you have to know when you're tested so that you do not forsake Him because He makes everything look so natural with these tests. And you got to pray, Lord, let my choice be your choice. Let my decision be your decision. Because when you're tested, like King David was tested, when he took a census, God sent Prophet Gad. You have offended the Lord. You have three choices. Famine, war, or pestilence. 
King David chose option number four. But God gave him three choices. He chose number four. You choose God. You choose my discipline for me. His whole life belonged to God. Even though God gave him the choice, David gave it back to God. You're my king. If we cannot learn how to wait for God, then we're telling God, you are not my sovereignty. If I want it now because my time, then I'm telling God, I'm the king of my own life, the king of my time, the king of my circumstances. If, you, if God is your king, then you have to learn submission. And when he tells you something, whether through me or directly or any other way, you need to listen. You can't look at your own circumstances because now you're, you're assessing your own world. And he's going to make you move when it's most hard. Because the devil came to Jesus to test him when he was most hungry. 40 days fasting, no food and water. And now he comes to test them at the weakest point. So we're going to be tested. Not when things are easy. You're going to be tested both lack and, and abundance. And so this is the time. This is the growth period right now as God is raising us up to restore his people back onto him. These are the abundant years that you need to take advantage of. To store up your spiritual barns with prayer, with submission, with obedience, forgiveness, love. You got to store this up now in your comfort, in your financial abundance. Because when the days of lack come, you will be in full confidence to Him. And you will not worry. And those people who are panicking will come to us. Because we will have the answer. Amen. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and pray, and then I'll take a short break and uh, come for worship.